Okay, everybody, we're gonna we're gonna get started. You need to uh, mute your microphones if they happen to be on, uh, unless you're speaking. Um, this is a seminar of the Harvard China Project on Energy, Economy, and Environment, which is based in the Harvard Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. My name is Chris Nielsen. I'm the executive director. Um, we're fortunate today to have th uh, three co-sponsors of this talk here at Harvard. Two of them are based in the Kennedy School. It's the Rajawali Foundation Institute for Asia and the Center for International Development. And then we're also co-sponsored by the Asia Center, which is a, a, a university-wide program focusing on Pan-Asia issues, especially Southeast Asia, which is based in the Faculty of uh, Arts and Sciences. Uh, I have a few housekeeping things before um, I set a little context and then uh, introduce our speaker. Uh, the first thing is that the seminar is being recorded, so keep that in mind if you're uh, going to ask a question. Um, we like to make our seminars as close as our online seminars as close as possible to sort of in-person seminars. And what that means mainly is that we want to encourage discussion with the speaker and you'll be able to ask questions directly through Zoom, through your microphone. Um, so when the time comes, you'll need to raise your hand to uh, electronically or, or, or visually uh, to be called on. And then you turn on your microphone and ask your question and you can get into some conversation if you want. But that does mean you need to keep your microphones muted in the meanwhile. And we'll try to keep an eye on that and mute them for you if you forget. Uh, another thing is that um, our next seminar will be in two weeks uh, from today. It's going to be a little bit earlier, uh, Boston time, 10 a.m., um, because we're going to have a speaker from China and the time difference. Uh, it's Dong, Dong Changwei from Renmin University uh, School of Public Administration and Policy. He's going to be speaking about feed-in tariffs on wind and solar power development in China. So before uh, I introduce our speaker, I want to set just a little bit of context about the, 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 this, this, this talk. Um, as a lot of you know, the Harvard China Project has worked with Chinese partners for nearly 30 years on issues of climate change, air pollution, uh, energy systems, economy, um, environmental health, and, and other fields. And over this time, I mean, we've built up a lot of capacity, including in, in China, research, collaborative research capacity in these fields, mainly focused on uh, China and the, and, and the U.S. And we think it's a, a a natural evolution of our program and our Chinese uh, partners uh, uh, feel this way too, to begin applying what is now relatively mature collaborative capacities and knowledge that we've developed on our countries um, to other parts of the world um, where the maybe the capacities, research capacities are not as developed. So, um, and we're starting out by looking uh, primarily at um, uh, sort of fast growing middle income countries in Asia. Uh, and this talk is uh, uh, aligned with that. So anyway, this seminar is a bit of a learning process for all of us. We're kind of extending our scope and please, when it gets to the Q&A, don't be shy about asking any question uh, you want. Um, so interestingly, our, our our speaker today has followed this path a little bit himself. Uh, he is uh, uh, Yang Liang or Emlyn Yang. He is uh, uh, a geographer. He started his research uh, primarily in China, but over recent years has uh, been moving uh, also into research in, in, in developing Asia. Uh, he is a senior researcher and lecturer in the Department of Geography at the University of Munich. He got his PhD at the University of Hamburg and um, in geography, human geography. And he has prior degrees from the Chinese Academy of Sciences and Southwest University in Chongqing in, uh, in human geography or, or, or natural resources. He's had a, a lot of different uh, uh, involvement in projects around the world um, and throughout Germany and, and, and Europe, including uh, um, positions in Barcelona, Spain. He was involved in, a, in an MIT project here in Boston and, and, and beyond. He, he uh, describes his research interests as social resilience to climate change impacts, urban resilience and sustainability qualitative and quantitative analysis of regional socio-environmental systems, 
spatial temporal analysis of human environment interactions in developing Asia. And his main tools of research are household surveys, social network analysis, GIS, and agent-based modeling. So, Dr. Yang, please. Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much, Chris, for the nice introduction. Um, I'm very honored to have this opportunity to talk here. Um, yeah, um, maybe I, I just see a few words as well. So I got to know this Harvard China project for quite a long time. So I was following the newsletter every time. So I got to know what happens there. I'm quite kind of interested on, on this project. So um, just this year, only a few weeks, we got contact with Chris and uh, say whether there are opportunities uh, to, to do some cooperative work. And Chris nicely responded on that positively. Although you will see in my talk that uh, I what I'm doing is not really exactly on, on uh, the current activities in the China project, but Chris said uh, um, uh, you uh, uh, have this uh, intention to extend the scope and to have some in, in new initiatives in Southeast Asia. So it uh, uh, should be uh, somehow interesting to some members here. So that's why I came to this uh, uh, seminar. Um, yeah, thanks for that. So now I will just start with my presentation and I will share my screen. Um, so now could you just tell me whether it works well? Can you say it's well? It's a presentation mode, right? Yes. Okay. That's great. Okay, I just thought. Yeah, thanks. Um, as you see from the announcement, the title is about understanding and enhancing climate resilience in the Mekong Basin. Um, I, I talked to Chris about this title. I could also talk about the energy carbon emission reduction, but Chris said it may be more interesting for the project members or uh, colleagues there to learn something a little bit different with the energy and carbon emissions. So I decided to talk about climate resilience. Actually, climate resilience is my core research um, for recent years. Um, I could first give an over, overview of my uh, research vision, let's say, try to um, uh, establish or, or somehow alternative resolution, uh, resilience uh, solutions to climate impacts and to work in this emerging research field of resilience science and to promote the innovative, uh, innovative resilience thinking instead of uh, risk thinking, let's say. Well, um, well, just a quick content. I'll talk about climate resilience in general, flood resilience, Mekong Basin, and climate resilience for the Mekong Basin for the future. Um, why I got to this topic? Actually, during my PhD study in Hamburg, I, I, I work mainly on climate-related risks and the vulnerability of the Pierre River Delta in southern China. So at that time, I did some research on climate change trends using Earth system model. Uh, I, I did assessment of flood vulnerability. I did also uh, uh, analyze on water management, stakeholder analysis, you know, kind of quite yeah, the normal know, or, or tra traditional like, issues uh, uh, on this topic. But then I started to think, uh, Currently, the study of climate impacts very much focus on these kind of keywords. Let's say risk, exposure, vulnerability, damage, losses, adaptation needs. Now you often you hear these words. Now. And then for some future climate losses, you often see that um, uh, some research would say that uh, after 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, it could be uh, very serious uh, climate impacts, uh, extreme hazards, and so on, if we don't do anything. You know, many of the studies just make predictions to the future, and they add a condition that if we human society don't do sufficient responses, don't do sufficient uh, um, coping measures. So I start to think that the missing part it's the resilience enhancement. It's not true that we will not do anything. Eh? Well, the research, you can see that, assume we don't do anything and what's the losses, what's the damage could be. But in fact, in, in the real world, many countries, many societies, cities, 
governments are making efforts to do a lot of things to cope with climate impacts. Actions, upgrades, infrastructures, coping capacity, responding measures, emerging relief, no? a lot of measures will be taken in the uh, next few decades. Uh, I've got uh, a pop-up window. That's okay. Yeah, so the next, um, then what is exactly resilience? Although many people are, are, are talking about this concept, resilience, but still there are quite a lot of confusing I've seen. From my understanding, the resilience, the word or the concept comes from originally uh, in, in material science, physics science, like uh, how resilient the spring, the steel, uh, uh, bricks, cement are, and how resilient the engineering uh, structures like buildings, dams, highway. And then they are also a, a big part of studies focusing on human uh, mental and um, uh, psychological uh, health issues. They use the word resilience as well. But then since 1970s, actually 1973, um, Crawford Horning used the word uh, resilience in ecosystem. So he studied uh, the resilience and the stability of um, ecosystem. Then just at the change of the century, uh, many researchers used the resilience uh, to human society, to the social ecosystem. And then now you see yeah, many studies, many reports nationally, internationally, uh, uh, no Kony, you see everywhere resilience uh, uh, are mentioned. Yeah, But then let's say we, if we want to make a, a definition of resilience, I set this uh, um, Professor Falkers uh, definition, resilience is basically a capacity. So if you use it in a social ecosystem, it could be the capacity of the socio-ecological system to absorb stress, maintain, function, adopt uh, disturbances, transform to more desirable configurations. That's the, the, the definition. But still, many people have their own definitions in different fields. That's okay, but I think this one is so widely accepted. So basically, the resilience is the capacity of persistence, adaptability, and transformability. But uh, uh, um, to specify it to climate resilience, it's the resilience of social ecosystems to climate impacts. Yeah? That makes sense. Yes. But also sometimes people wondering, do we really have resilience to climate impacts? I would suggest to see two facts. The first fact is that, see the thriving population growth and economic development in climate risky areas. No, that's a fact. And fact two is that the surviving human ecosystems in various extreme environment on the earth, in very high mountains, in dry desert areas, in Amazon uh, uh, forest, you know, so that indicates definitely human society have a capacity of resilience to climate and environment impacts. So for in, in doing climate resilience study, I call it a positive perspective on climate resilience issues because we, I focus on how we can still do or how we can improve our capacity to do that. I'm not highlighting or I'm not stressing the risks, the difficulties, the crisis, the damages, the losses. No, I, I do from a positive perspective see that, see what we can do and what could we could still do in the future. So that's my uh, uh, kind of research philosophy, let's say. Okay, now I come to a few uh, 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 specific case studies. Some are related, very related to the Mekong Basin. Next, this one, I, I um, edited a book volume um, just uh, three years ago. Um, in this book, there's a case study um, on this T Horse Road area at the ma ma upper Mekong Basin. It's uh, Southwest China. Um, it's a historical road. It's just like a Silk Road. You may know Silk Road, but you, you may not familiar with the T Horse Road. They are basically in the similar thing, but this T Horse Road just cross mountain areas between 
between Southwest China and India, and also touches Tibet um, uh, quite heavily. So this road network starts very early, more than 2000 years ago. At that time, the Qing dynasty conquered Yunnan, uh, the, the Southwest China, the minority area, and they um, uh, constructed some just a stone roads, like you see in the picture. And it's this, uh, these roads are, uh, they have some uh, very early uh, recorded, officially involved and best reserved roads still now. If you go there, you can still visit um, this part. And especially exciting is the Air High Lake Basin there. I did uh, um, a research on the past, uh, it's uh, I think uh, 390 years <clears throat> for this area. We see this our high lake basin. It has very frequent uh, uh, flood event, uh, flood hazards over the last uh, uh, around 400 years. And one specific thing is that you see this river channels changes very frequently. It does. It, it was not only that water, too much water goes uh, on the ground, but the waterways change frequently. Now that's a huge difficulty or a huge disaster for the Noko people. And well, how do the Noko people deal with this? First, there are indigenous people. Indigenous people live at the hilly area, at a higher place. And they plant tomatoes, wheat, maize. So they try to avoid flood. So that's their strategy. And then the Han people from central China, migrate there and uh, uh, live uh, at the flat area and they start to plant, let's say, rice, vegetations, and they brought uh, some of the hydrological facilities, the technologies there and to start uh, hydrological engineering. And also they have uh, gradually learned or, or uh, uh, kind of practiced some water control measures, like to divide uh, water and sand, to divide sand from different uh, branches of the river and so on. It's, well, the pictures are from current days, but uh, the, the sets are the same, and it, was, it can be um, uh, uh, tracked to uh, over a thousand years ago. And also this area, very interestingly, they have their own culture. So it's, water related culture and religions that say they have their strong belief on their gold of water so even if they suffer from a, a drought or, or uh, floods this year but they still believe that maybe we did something wrong so this year we suffer but maybe next year it could be better something like this no? it's very very interesting so that although they suffered from hazards still they have a strong uh, let's say a uh, uh, willingness to to live there to develop further and uh, uh, to develop even better. Okay, that's a specific case. But here I make a summary uh, analysis of uh, of the scale effects of flood resilience measures. You see this nice graph. It's quite complicated, but I summarize it to three uh, uh, single sentences. Let's say. A single measure is effective only in a certain space and period. For example, the government system, central government system or local government system, you see, you see the blue and this, uh, uh, let's see, yellow bubbles. Um, you see they are effective only at uh, uh, months, year scale uh, from regional to, uh, to city village scale. And, but in other areas, they are not so uh, maybe I, it's better I look at this screen here. Yeah, and in other areas, they are not so effective. So all the bubbles are the same, like risk and warning, social charity, vulnerability, uh, uh, voluntary assist. Basically, to summarize it, that each resilience measure is effect in a certain space and time. So then the measures, they have different effectiveness, but all the measures put together, if you are able to implement many kind of different measures, then you are able to cope with flood in a large extent of space and time. So that's the, uh, the idea. So that's the first uh, case. And second one is uh, what I'm currently working 
It's a uh, uh, household level flood resilience at Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. So it's a uh, it's a part of, uh, work of uh, the project Decider. It's called Decider, funded by German uh, government, a joint project with uh, uh, Vietnam. And we did household survey. Well, actually, during the pandemic period in 2020, that was quite a difficult thing, but we managed to, to do a household survey of 1,000 households in eight wards and four di districts in Ho Chi Minh City. And uh, you see some pictures of uh, how we did that. We have local partners, of course. Um, yeah. Okay, this map just shows the location of the uh, um, service and the uh, city situation of uh, the study area, but I would jump to the next slide. Then use the survey data. Um, we did some statistical patterns of flood responses at household level. Let's say this uh, nice graph, you could see that Apparently, many of the household uh, um, responses, um, they, they took quite diverse uh, uh, flood response measures, let's say, like precaution, emergency, long-term adaptation, receiving support, or some of them don't do any anything, uh, no action at all. And But uh, you can see that uh, uh, the monthly income level, many of them are uh, between uh, this is two to four, which is 1 million, Vietnam, Vietnam is down uh, to 20 million. Yeah, that's the basic uh, description of the household. Then we make an hierarchical clustering of the house. So we want to know who did what and why, and what, the, uh, uh, what are their profiles. Let's say I classified the household by external supports of households uh, received. Let's say whether they get any warning or emergency relief or support all their precaution measures, emergency measures, or long-term adaptation measures. So based on the different measures, we classify the households. So in each uh, uh, cluster, we can uh, make the subclusters into uh, uh, more specific groups. I just, I have a lot of these things to show, but I just make one example. Let's say this, there are seven clusters identified regarding receiving external support. This graph, um, seven groups, and here in this table you could see who are exactly the five, uh, the seven clusters. For example, the first cluster are those families who didn't receive any warning, who didn't receive emergency relief, who didn't receive any support, and those are the most of the surveyed households, five hundred and ten among the one thousand households, and they are basically the the main body of the uh, uh, sur uh, surveyed households, and they are cluster two and three. They don't receive warning, uh, no emergency relief, but they all have elevation uh, uh, support. That means they got funding or investment or labor helps or any kind of support to build their house higher. Yeah, that's kind of. Then uh, cluster five, class, uh, cluster three here, they have warning or have emergency relief. And those are the people who uh, got labor support from labor uh, from their laborers or from relatives or from government. Anyway, so you can talk a lot of this uh, detailed sense of how are the households uh, taking measures and how um, uh, they deal with the flood. But um, since we have limited time, I just uh, uh, stop here. But this shows how detailed we can go with the household level flood responses. No? Okay, with that work, we link this resilience measures to the physical house features. That means, well, we want to know how resilient the households are, but if we don't have this survey data, let's say if, for example, in the pandemic period, we are not able to do household surveys, but then how we do that? We do that by remote sensing data. We do that by remote sensing images, by LIDAR data, by many kinds of um, uh, satellite images to analyze the house structure, the house type, the urban topography, topography, 
and we try to make a link between the house features and the socio-economic uh, uh, flood resilience. And this are still ongoing work. We use machine learning, other booster algorithm to establish uh, this fit function between house features and the uh, resilience. And also we have another work is that we, uh, this is, uh, uh, I studied this uh, urban growth model, but it's currently done by my colleague. Um, but in, in our group, we try to model the urban growth into the future. We want to know where will be urban and how um, the, the area will be and what kind of morphology would be, what kind of buildings could be there. And in the end, we want to combine them together to build up an agent-based model for human responses to climate and also flood impacts. Because now then you are able to know what the urban will be and what the humans will be. So then we put them together into an agent-based model, we will be able to model the system under climate change impacts. Yeah, the last case study um, would be a model of household responses to floods. Well, I, I'm talking about similar things, but uh, uh, they are uh, different cases. No? So this one is uh, an agent-based model I did um, uh, uh, after my PhD. So basically I set up an agent settings like many households. I set up uh, a local research uh, environment um, conditions and I set up rainfall scenario. Then we get the agents, that's people, households. We get the flood event and the model we simulate how humans adapt and respond to flood and how the flood impact those humans. And in the end, we calculate the cost and damage and say how effective their responses are. So in this model, the response behaviors are involved. Let's say how people make decisions uh, when they receive warnings, and then how do they invest to reduce their uh, uh, vulnerability and to uh, start protect themselves and so on. So that's the behavior. Um, then I have the scenario of rainfall flood event, and I have the flood inundation process how the flood water goes up and down, how the flood events starts and ends, and so on. In the end, we calculate the damage losses based on the flood water depths and also the, uh, uh, the damage rate, let's say. And uh, yeah, we have quite a lot of mathematical calculations there, but just to uh, the normal uh, logic to calculate flood damage to each household. Um, this study was done in Hong Kong. It's a small suburb area in northern Hong Kong. And uh, we got quite a lot of interesting maps that you may not be able to see the details. But for this big map, I can see that you see the decrease in rainfall intensity to here and the increase in warning increase uh, uh, here. But the most seriously flooded area is actually in this uh, in this map, in this small map. Why? Because it, here um, uh, people don't get, let's see something, because people don't get warning information here. And it's not the extreme, uh, extreme rainfall scenario. It's just a less extreme rainfall scenario. This tells one key message that Flood damage not often happens at the most extreme scenarios, but combined with capacity to deal with it. If you get information early, you prepare for it, you, don't, you can significantly reduce the damage. So that's the, the key message from the model result. Um, yeah. The model also give results to which each specific household, you can see that how much damage they suffered and how much investment they put and uh, compare their cost and benefits there. No? Some households even have very little flood loss because uh, uh, no, uh, have little flood uh, uh, responding cost, but they protect themselves very well so that they don't have damage at all. Yeah. 
Okay, then I move to the next part of my talks. That's uh, my current um, uh, EU funded uh, grant, which is called Stories, the Spatial Temporal Dynamic of Flood Resilience in the Mekong Basin. Um, here, the essential research question is that how did and how does human society develop and maintain its resilience to flood? As I mentioned already, the uh, uh, risk gap in this uh, field is that we often don't look at this positive side of flood management. There were quite a lot of, we can call it successful flood management management cases in the uh, in the area and in many areas as well. But we need to study how and why those uh, uh, flood can be well managed and well responded. So that's the uh, uh, <coughs> work of this project. Um, for doing this, I select this T horse road area again, but more extensive area in Southwest China. It's uh, uh, Kunming, Chengdu here, Chongqing. And I focus on this mountain area from Yaan to uh, Xitang and from Lijiang to Dali. So these are mountain areas. The ethnic communities living there, and the, the 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 message about flood is that they mitigated flood risk over a long historical period. At a very early time, let's say thousand years ago, they can only avoid flood being flooded, but now they live in flood prone area. Yeah? So that's the big change. And then I want to make a comparison study with the Mekong Delta area. Why it's interesting because it's a coastal river Delta. It has very high population density, but the strategy of dealing with water, flood is that they live with flood. This area has been flooded over thousands of years. No? But still people are living there, population are growing, economic development, but they didn't significantly reduce the flood risk. Actually, no. So what's the, but they improved their own living, let's say coping capacity. So they are still able to live in the flood area. So that's interesting thing. And Although these two areas are diverse, but they are connected. They are in the Mekong Basin, huh? and they have centuries of historical records available so that we can track the flood events, the flood impacts, uh, uh, and responses over uh, uh, to the past um, hundred of years. Um, this slide may not be very interesting for you, but just uh, four different work packages. Uh, I will do some theoretical study and the empirical case study in the areas, in uh, uh, case areas, then I will do modeling of the spatial temporal dynamics there. And in the end, I try to make some uh, transferences of the uh, research study to other areas. Uh, one interesting thing that I, I would like to talk about, uh, about my approach. So I will, as I mentioned already, I will use agent-based model and social network analysis. Um, you may know the agent-based model. The model can combine nature environment conditions with act human activities, human behaviors. So it's, it's a perfect tool to model the interactions between flood and human. Let's say flood event here and household communities and uh, how the uh, household and community respond to flood events. Then, Social network analysis is able to connect a different group of people. Yeah? So you are able to analyze who acts what, who helps whom, and how they work together um, uh, to, to cope with uh, uh, hazards. Yeah? So combine these two work together, we will be able to model uh, uh, flood impacts within a networked social system. So that's a kind of uh, uh, new approach, I think. Um, in this case, we'll be able to uh, understand better how um, a, a, a human community deal with flood, because normally it's not a person or household alone to deal with floods. Yeah, 
many households or stakeholders, the uh, people in the social system, they get a lot of information, resources, materials, support, financial resources, any many things from others. So that network is very important. So that's my approach. Um, then we will connect data of the historical period, basically in the last uh, 600 years. And we also do um, a household service in the study areas. Let's say we will connect at least 800 survey households in each of the case areas. <coughs> but of course, we will also use some secondhand data, statistical data, remote sensing, and so on um, to do this work. Um, we have studied collected data already, <coughs> but as I said, the project will start uh, uh, this year in April, so we are at the beginning phase uh, of the project. We don't have concrete results yet, but that's something um, I can share to you um, uh, to let you know what we're going to do in the next years. And beyond this project, I'm uh, at the moment trying to establish a, a so-called resilience hub uh, now here um, at Munich, so we want to do and, and a kind of virtual hub that we share um, uh, study progresses about resilience and also share ideas, cooperate uh, on, on researches. And uh, yeah, just uh, a lot, uh, lot of different activities can happen here about resilience study. But uh, we have our focus uh, uh, emphasis, of course, on resilience theory study, flood resilience, urban resilience, agricultural resilience, and also methodological development. And we have already some basis to do this, actually. Let's say um, we have a Google group on climate resilience, which is already nearly uh, um, 1,300 people now. We also have the recharge group with Chinese colleagues, um, quite a lot of uh, members already. We organized a flood resilience risk workshop last year, and we, uh, we are going to this um, European uh, Geoscience Union um, this year in April, and we will organize another conference um, uh, uh, in two years, in three years, um, again on this topic. Yeah, that's basically so much about what I have done about resilience, about climate resilience, and also flood resilience, especially. And then <clears throat> I talked uh, uh, in, in email also with Chris that what I want to do uh, to initiate, to cooperate with the uh, Harvard China project, um, with also other uh, Harvard colleagues about one research on the changing resilience by hydropower development and water management at the Mekong Basin. This is a big uh, uh, topic of wide interest, I think. Um, it is actually a part of my uh, EU project, but it was cut due to uh, budget reasons uh, uh, of same, but still I want to do it, so I think it will be a good thing to uh, develop it with um, uh, Harvard colleagues, uh, since you have uh, some uh, similar interests in Southeast Asia, in the Mekong Basin, in Vietnam. So I, since this is a plan, I don't have uh, uh, details to tell, but my idea is that we want to study how does the river discharge change due to many hydro power plant um, uh, constructed in the Mekong Basin. And then what is the relation to flood and drought events in this area? Then is resilience enhanced or worsened by this hydro, uh, hydropower development, development? Now that's the essential idea, uh, uh, questions that I want to answer in this study. There could be a second um, topic for cooperation is that how could the policy be designed or a better improved for connective resilience building in the Mekong Basin? That's a, also a big topic. As you all know, the China, Chinese government initiated this uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and they put a heavy focus on Southeast Asia. 
and to uh, to to construct many highways, railways, and power plant, and uh, energy uh, uh, um, pipelines, and so on. This is interesting thing, and I want to do some work related to this, but uh, uh, target to another side. Let's say how could this uh, uh, many hydropower uh, hydro reservoirs be coordinated in their in their operation during rainy season, during flood uh, season, and during dry seasons yeah? to better manage the water uh, in the spatial scale. And then, how the political and financial framework of ecosystem service compensation can be. Uh, implemented because in different areas, upstream, middle stream, downstream countries, they all com uh, complained about their loss, but uh, nobody is uh, willing to pay for, uh, uh, for, for, for nature reservation or something, yeah? water management. Yeah? Then there's a trading mechanism of carbon emission reductions because this hydropower plant it generates uh, uh, electricity and uh, reduce the carbon emission from coal plant, from oil plant, from gas plant. No? There's um, a, a heavy topic about carbon emission reduction involved. So I want to discuss this and to develop some, some uh, uh, post-money solutions on this topic. As I said, I don't have details to share, but that's so much about my idea. And uh, if uh, uh, the audiences here are interested, we could certainly discuss further and uh, to get more uh, details on it and to really work out some research. That's uh, basically my talk, actually. I don't have more to share, but I hope this information are uh, helpful uh, or uh, interesting or, or uh, inspiring, so I expect some questions from you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was